Hello everybody, Sonda Dilaja here, welcoming you back to our class that we are doing concerning African people. Are African people cursed? Are black skinned people cursed? <laughs> you would not even imagine that, you would not even tolerate that idea if you know the history of black people. Uh, so let's continue studying about black people and the topic of today is African warlords in the Roman army. You cannot get to be a warlord in the uh, Roman army if you are <laughs> if 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 you are a slave if you if you are cursed because Africans were some of the greatest warlords and military generals in the Roman army the greatest army of that empire the greatest civilization that ever been uh, Rome, I mean, the longest reigning civilization the most advanced civilization at that point but um so Roma, if black people find their way there so let's go and uh, so here we go moors were actively employed into the military service by the roman empire so who are the moors the moors are the people that live in the modern day mauritania uh, Mauritania and Mali. Mauritania, Mali, Guinea, Algeria, that whole area, especially Mauritania. Moors are the citizens of Mauritanians. Mauritanians is their, na is their name up to today, but they call them Mauritanians, I mean, they, they call them Moors for short for in Europe. That's what they call them they're during the Roman Empire. So if you look at the African map, you will see where Mauritania is. We showed it yesterday. And if you go to the video, you will see how black the Mauritanian people are. So Mauritanians are the people they call Moor. So Moors were actively employed into military service by the Roman Empire and accommodated in Britain, France, Switzerland, Austria, Hungary, Romania, and Poland. Many of these Africans rose to the highest military ranks. <laughs> they can do it, they are dark, right? An official Roman, Roman state document dating from the second century uh, AD mentions Moorish soldiers, soldiers in Moesia. Moesia is the present day Central Europe uh, of Yugoslavia. It used to be called Yugoslavia, or right now it's called Serbia. So the, there used to be a military base in Serbia. Uh, that is for black people, just a military, a black African military base right there in, uh, in Serbia. You see, this is it. So this is the center of Europe and that place you are seeing, that is Yugoslavia or Serbia right now, that is where the military base of uh, this African warlords and military was. Another similar document from 158 tells about Moorish soldier, so, so, soldiers from Africa in Dacia, which is present-day Romania. You know, talking about uh, uh, army gar gar garrison in the Balkans. A Roman document, Notitia Dignatatum, list of po which is a list of positions dating the beginning of the fifth century ref refers to several Moorish battalions in the Balkans. A Moorish military colony at Mahuros on the Inn River near Vienna, Austria, and the city of Moro Castrum, present day uh, Belgorod Neprovsk in Ukraine. <laughs> that is where we used to have the military base of uh, African warriors and in Vienna, Austria and the Balkans. So this is the do Roman document uh, Notitia Dignatatum where the uh, positions and the ranking of officers of the Roman Empire did, is the, like they are uh, positions in that in in the military, and uh, so it's acknowledged the black 
generals in those places situated and the garrisons. Also, according to this document, between 2,000 to 2,000, between 2,500 and 5,000 Illyrian Moorish soldiers served in the Middle East as a part of five separate military units, you see. On this basis, it can be concluded that at the beginning of the 5th century, at least 100,000 descendants of Moors lived in Illyri uh, Lyricum, the territory of the present-day Balkan Peninsula. 100,000. You see, I told you that they are garrisons. They are military centers. So in total, there were 100,000 people, black people, military people, in the Balkan, in this whole area. So it's part of Rome. African Lucius uh, Cuetos became a Roman military commander in the time of Emperor Domitian and Trajan, who called him his successor. Trajan died in 117 AD, and the following year, Lucio Quietus was killed. He only managed to be the emperor uh, to rule for one year. But not everybody could bear it that a black person was the ruler of, uh, of the great Roman Empire. This may have been done on the orders of Emperor Adria, Adrian, who feared the popular general. Being purely of African origin, he was described as a man of the Moorish race and the most capable soldier, soldier of the Roman Empire, of the Roman army. Now, you should remember that even though Mori, the Moors were Mauritanians, but they used that word, that language, for all black people, black, they, that's the same word as people use black today, or Negro, black, or Ethiopian. Trajan's column in Rome, created by the architect Apollodorus of Damascus in 113 AD, in honor of Trajan's victories over the tribes of Dacian, depicts Moorish cavalry under the command of Lucius fighting with the seers so the, it is depicted in in this uh, column that we are seeing here as a is the memorial you see on the top you see on top of that column you see a human being there well that is lucius the black man because he's the one that uh, uh you know fought and on the on the side of the roman empire and got them that victory A terracotta head, another work of that period, was found and it looked very similar to the heads of the cavalry, cavalry depicted on Trajan's col column, described by archaeologists as the head of a negro or a moor. So this is the, the, uh, the Trajan column and the black one on top and this is the head that is there. You see, Troya column. The other Roman military and political figure was an African uh, Quintus uh, Lolius Ubicus. Ubicus. Okay. He was the one who conquered most of Scotland, a black man, for the Roman Empire, and built a 58-kilometer road, Antonin Wall, which was the northwestern border of the Roman Empire. He was a member of the Roman Senate, hmm. that's a black man, a people's trib tribune and a uh, praetor. He received a spear and a golden crown as a military award and ruled the province of Lower Germany or because built Korea, Korea present-day coverage near Newcastle. So the England, England you have today was also a part of the contribution of the black man. Not as slave but as governor. In uh, 146 to 160 uh, he was the pre prefect of Rome, 
This is after Christ. A prefect was a Roman official who was appointed to rule Rome in the absence of consuls of the emperor or the emperor. So when the emperor is not present or the consul, he became the prefect. Consul of Numidia, North Africa, Xenophilus bragged about his grandfather that he was a soldier serving in the imperial entourage because he was a Moor. Wow. So that is, those are historic documents. Well, I'm, we just to show you that uh, even during the Roman Empire, Africans' services were employed and Africans were prominently present in the greatest civilization of the time. And I'm going to show you a video that will show you also that even some Africans, African tribes, confronted Rome and had uh, conflict and successfully competed with the great Roman Empire army. So I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the video for you to see some of the historical fact of the greatness of the African people even back during those days. But meanwhile, please go share the message, share, share, share. And if you want to join our mentorship class, go to sundayadelajablog.com slash mentorship. If you want to go with us back to Africa to build a great Africa, go to sundayadelajablog.com slash Africa, I mean, uh, slash Nigeria. If you want to uh, join our uh, history makers training, HMT, go to sundayadelajablog.com slash HMT. And if you want to get my books, the same, sundayadelajablog.com slash books, or you could go to Amazon to get it, or, uh, or you can even read them for free on Kindle Unlimited. So thank you so much. And uh, soon we are going to share the video, we are going to watch the video, and tomorrow we'll continue with the class. My name is Dr. Raul McLaughlin, and my subject is Trade Beyond the Roman Frontiers. I have published several books on this subject. I am a member of the Council of the Classical Association of Northern Ireland. The question is, how did an African kingdom challenge Rome? This is part one. For details on ancient African kingdoms, see my book, The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean, Chapter 5, Beyond Egypt, The Nile Route and the African Kingdom of Moreau. The vast Saharan desert confined the Roman Empire to the Mediterranean fringe of North Africa. But the Nile River provided a route south. This led Romans into sub-Saharan Africa for exploration, commerce, and an encounter with an ancient kingdom called Moreau, or Meroe. This explains how the Roman Emperor Augustus found himself at war with an African kingdom. Like its northern neighbour Egypt, the Kingdom of Moreau had a long and complex history which predated the Roman conquest of the Mediterranean by several centuries. The wealth and fertility of Moreau depended on the Nile, which flowed from sources deep within Africa. The White Nile emerges nearly 4,000 miles south of the Mediterranean coast and surges north to join with the soil-rich Blue Nile in the Sudan. From there it flows across a series of rapids, known as cataracts, before entering Egypt near the ancient frontier city of Sine, modern Aswan. Mro was part of the region known as Nubia, where the Nile flows through narrow gorges flanked by cliffs. The early Egyptians described Nubia as desolate, but it produced gold, and its inhabitants brought African goods to the first cataract, including ivory, leopard pelts, slaves, ebony, and Somali incense. At the time of the pharaohs, these territories were dominated by an African people called the Kush, who had their capital, Anapata, northern Sudan. Most of the early history of Kushite civilization is recorded in Egyptian hieroglyphics, but the Greeks also heard stories about them. They called the Kush Ethiopia, a name which the Romans adopted as Ethiopia. The Kushites were amongst the tallest people of the ancient world, 
and their warriors were renowned for their strength, with their king chosen as the strongest amongst all contenders. They were described in Greek accounts as possessing remarkably slender bodies with an athletic physique and very dark skin. They served in the Egyptian army as specialist archers, as their height and strength allowed them to handle palm wood bows which were up to six feet long. They also carried spears and studded clubs carved from knotted wood. According to classical accounts, many warriors wore clothing fashioned from the skins of leopards and lions, giving them a distinctive appearance on the battlefield. They used red and white war paint, and Herodotus describes their characteristic appearance, painted half with gypsum and half with vermilion. The historian Diodorus reports, When their arrows are exhausted, they finish the fight with wooden clubs. They also arm their women. They set an age limit for female service, and most of them observe the custom of wearing a bronze ring in their lip. During the New Kingdom era, Egyptian pharaohs conquered Nubia as far south as the Fourth Cataract, and imposed many of their own political structures and customs on Kushite society. The Kushite ruling class adopted Egyptian culture, and when the power of the pharaohs began to decline in the 8th century BC, they led their African armies north to take control of Egypt. The kings of Kush established a dynasty of African pharaohs that ruled both kingdoms between 751 and 656 BC. These Africans appear in the earliest Greek legends, including the Trojan War. It was said that when the city of Troy summoned overseas allies to repel the Greek invasion of their homeland, an Ethiopian prince named Memnon came with a force of African warriors. Memnon was defeated and killed in personal combat with the Greek champion Achilles. In later centuries, Greek visitors to Egypt were shown statues of Amenhotep III, said to be the Memnon named in that legend. Two heavily eroded, giant statues, known as the Colossi of Memnon, were said to represent the Cushite hero. After the Assyrians invaded Egypt in 671 BC, the Cush retreated back into Nubia. In 592 BC, they moved their capital south to a site called Moreau, between the 5th and 6th cataracts. There the Kush constructed sophisticated temple buildings and followed Egyptian burial practices, constructing steep stone pyramids for their royal dead. When the Persian king Cambyses II conquered Egypt in 525 BC, he sent spies south with gifts, offering friendship to King Amantakabete of Moreau, who scorned all but the wine and accused the Persians of deceit. Herodotus describes how the king produced an enormous bow and said, When the Persians can string this bow, they can come against us, but come with many soldiers, for the Ethiopians do not die easily. Until then, the Persian king should thank the gods that we, the sons of Ethiopia, do not covet lands that are not ours. Despite this, Cambyses led an army south to attack Moreau, but the Persians were unprepared for the lengthy desert march and turned back when their supplies were exhausted. Nevertheless, part of northern Nubia appears to have been added to the Persian Empire, since King Darius received tribute from this region and soldiers were levied to fight for the Persians. Herodotus reports that when Xerxes invaded Greece in 480 BC, a large contingent of African troops were present in his army. Herodotus visited Egypt in 450 BC and travelled south as far as Sine and the island of Elephantine at the first cataract. Elephantine may have got his name from its role in the ivory trade or because the large boulders found on its shores resemble the hunch shapes of crouching elephants. 
The Ptolemaic queen Cleopatra VII was the last Greek ruler of Egypt. In the final civil war of the Roman Republic, she and the Roman general Mark Antony were defeated by Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar. By 30 BC, he had annexed Egypt and established it as the richest and most productive province in the Roman Empire. In 27 BC, Octavian became the first emperor of Rome, taking the name Augustus. Gaius Cornelius Gallus, a military colleague of Augustus, was appointed the province's first governor. Of equestrian rank, Cornelius Gallus was also a poet, much admired by Virgil, and of whom Ovid predicted, literary fame extending as far as his military commands, but enduring longer. When Gallus took office in Egypt, he led Roman forces south to suppress a revolt in Sine. During these operations, he crossed the first cataract and seized the island temple site of Philae in northern Nubia. The local ruler accepted Roman terms, and representatives of King Terechitas of Moreau arrived to meet Gallus. To celebrate his exploits, Gallus had a trilingual inscription erected at Philae with messages in Egyptian hieroglyphics, Latin and Greek. It records in Greek how Gallus received the title of Proxenia, political associate, from the Marotic ambassadors. In the Latin text, however, he claims to have accepted Moreau into Roman protection as a vassal state. Gallus continued to celebrate his exploits with grandiose monuments, and Diocasius describes how he set up images of himself practically everywhere in Egypt and inscribed a list of his achievements, even upon the very pyramids. But after two years in office, Gallus was accused of disrespect towards the emperor. And when Augustus renounced their friendship, Gallus was threatened with numerous private lawsuits. He committed suicide rather than forfeit his family estates and his death left any future settlement between Rome and Moreau undecided. This is the end of part one. Please see part two for the war between Moreau and Rome. For further information, see my book, The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean. Follow the link below this video.